Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Um, I'm Dr. Anandi Rao. I'm a lecturer in South Asian studies um, here at SOAS. Um, and today, my taster lecture for you um, is titled, What Makes a Poem a Queer South Asian Poem? Um, I'm also the convener of the MA South Asian Area Studies um, and the MA South Asian Studies with Intensive Language. So, um, yeah. So um, today I want to think through with all of you um, the usefulness and limitations of South Asia and queer as analytic categories and also what it means to read a text as a queer South Asian text. So this is how we're gonna progress in the 20 minutes. The first is what is South Asia? Then how do different writers who think about non-heteronormative love and desire in South Asia deploy the terms queer and South Asia? Then we're going to focus on a poem by Asad Alvi called La Palsian de Mor and ask the question, can we read the poem as a queer South Asian poem? So first, what is South Asia? Is it just a geographical category that encompasses these um, these nation states. Um, the second question that arises is, is it another name for India or the Indian subcontinent? Um, and here I would refer to the work of Amina Muhammad Arif, um, who in a special issue that addressed the idea of uh, South Asia in her introduction, she writes, quote, the central and asymmetrical presence of India in various domains, including geography, is such that India's neighboring countries tend to perceive the category South Asia as Delhi-centric, end quote. So um, sometimes South Asia comes to stand in for India, like we don't want to say India, but we say South Asia, but we actually mean India. Um, so what does that mean? And what, um, what can we do to like decenter India's hegemony um, in South Asia? Then the third is, is South Asia a stable category? So Hassan Altaf writes, um, South Asia is, quote, not static, an object to be passed from parent to child. It's something that we make, something that we create and modify and reshape, end quote. Um, so it's something like an imagined community, to quote or to cite Benedict Anderson. Um, and it's not something fixed, but something that is imagined, something that we make, something that changes um, as borders change, as borders shift, um, but also as, um, as we change and as our perceptions of the region change. So now I'm going to look at three books um, and how they use the words, whether or not they've used the words queer and South Asia and how what they use instead. So first we start from the year 2000 um, in this really great book um, edited by Ruth Vanita and Salim Kidwai titled Same Sex Love in India. So in the preface, um, they write, um, they use India instead of South Asia, and that decision is arbitrary based on their limits and expertise. So one thing I want to highlight here is that there seems to be this changeability between India and South Asia. Um, like, does it, like, it's almost arbitrary that they're using India instead of South Asia, so it could have been South Asia. And then the second part, to do with queer is that they choose to use same-sex love um, and they say that the texts that they have chosen are homoerotically inclined and that queer in fact was too wide for our purposes so queer encompasses so many different things for them um, and they really wanted to focus on homoerotically inclined texts um, so i think here it's interesting that both queer and south asia um, are not used and perhaps they are both too broad for the project at hand. Then we come to this great book, The Doubleness of Sexuality, Idioms of Same-Sex Desire in Modern India by Akhil Katyal, a SOAS graduate. Uh, 
And um, as you can see, um, the title uses modern India and not um, South Asia. But in the first chapter or the introduction, Katyal writes um, that the book talks about gay and lesbian identity in the subcontinent. So again, there is this um, conflation between India, Indian subcontinent, and perhaps Indian subcontinent and South Asia. Um, but for me, what is very important about Katyal's work is that he talks about language and cultural idioms. Um, and that these idioms are often not in English, um, but in um, vernacular languages. So he's looking at North India. So you have um, North in like um, Hindi Urdu um, or Hindi words for like friendship, play, love, um, habits, etc., through which um, same sex desire operates. So I think that's really important in Katyal's work. And then we come to 2020 um, and we have again this um, really important anthology called The World That Belongs to Us, edited by Aditi Angiras and Akhil Katyal, um, the same Akhil Katyal from before. The subtitle here is an anthology of queer poetry from South Asia. So here we come. So we started in 2000, which was same sex love in India. And now we are in 2020 and it's queer poetry from South Asia, so both queer and South Asia. And in their preface, um, they write, quote, people live their lives through a maddeningly complex slew of names, identities, and gestures. Queer only pretends to signpost them all, but it is pre precisely that, a convenient pretense, meant for book covers, not for all its contents. So here queer becomes a signpost, and perhaps queer is a signpost in the same way that South Asia is a signpost. Um, so I want to think about the ways in which these two terms operate in similar ways, right? Um, that's um, what I'm trying to do here. So now we'll talk, and we'll move on swiftly um, and talk about this poem, La Palsion de Mort by Asad Alvi. Um, the title is um, in French uh, and it translates as Death Drive and it's from Freud. Um, some themes in this poem are queer death. Um, in terms of form, I want to highlight that it's multilingual and the repetition. And then that there are references to other authors, what in literary studies we call intertextuality. So there's references to Freud, as I mentioned, but also Virginia Woolf, Tennessee Williams, and Fares Ahmed Fares. So this is the poem. I'm going to read it out for you now. La Palsian de Mort, Asad Alvi. Ab yaha, koi nahi. Koi nahi aega, words, curling up like rings of smoke, bathroom floor, fares playing on the radio. I have filled my pockets with stones. There is a river nearby, the Bisnumati. I'm in Kathmandu, it's 2016. I have run away from home after a history of violence. And I broke up with the only boy who will ever love me every time he kissed my hips. My scars became flames. Ab yaha, koi nahi, koi nahi aega. Yaha, this unvisited body. It is the impossibility of queer love, the scholars say, for whom the only future carved out is death. For example, Williams, Tennessee. It is 1983. He is discovered dead in his hotel room. A cigarette hanging loosely from the lips a note addressed to Robert. On 1941, Virginia's body at the bottom of the river, the stone still in her pocket, her love for Vita undeclared. Ab yaha, koi nahi, koi nahi aega. Um, I just want to mention, I forgot to mention, Asad Alvi is a writer based in Karachi. Um, and their work engages, as you can see, um, in queer studies, Sufism and translation. So um, there's one line in Urdu that is mentioned again and again, or that is used again and again in the poem. Ab yaha, koi nahi, koi nahi aega. Um, this is from a poem called Tanhai, which is alternatively, alternatingly being translated as solitude and loneliness. Um, 
by Fez Ahmed Fez. Now, Fez is an interesting figure. Um, normally, he is called a Pakistani poet, but perhaps we can call him a South Asian poet because um, he was born in 1911, uh, before um, Pakistan and India were um, birthed, I suppose, um, and before independence and partition. But um, he is. Uh, known for his work on cosmopolitanism, lyric poetry, and poetry of partition. Um, scholars like Amina Yakin and Amir Mufti have worked a lot on Fez. Um, here I wanted to present to you seven translations of this one line um, to show you something about translation, because um, translation is important both for Asad Alvi and for me. Uh, and to think about translation as iteration and translation as reiteration. So um, each of these translations, even though it's one line, one line that we might think is a very simple line, um, it has been translated in different ways. And reading this, reading this collectivity of translation tells us what each translator focuses on like some focus on no one, some focuses on some focus on here, et cetera, some focus on return. Um, and it's really interesting for me that uh, there have been so many translations of this poem. And this suggests both that the poem is perhaps very translatable, but also that the poem is untranslatable. Um, or it shows us like there's a fine line between what is translatable and what is untranslatable. So I want, I want to leave you with that thought. So to come back to this poem, there are a few things I want to highlight. Uh, first in the blue, you can see the Urdu and the repetition of the Urdu um, from Fez. Um, however, it is in the English or Roman script um, with diacritical marks and not in Urdu. So again, we are thinking about who is the audience for this poem. Um, the second is that Yaha is emphasized and Yaha is like here. Um, but what is this here? At once, it is the geography and the geography of South Asia. Um, you have a Pakistani poet um, writing about Kathmandu and the river Bismati. But at the same time, Yaha is in pink, this unvisited body. So the here is also the body. Um, and somewhere um, there is an overlapping of geography and body um, and like bodiliness. The second is that you have. Um, queer mentioned, but it's like the impossibility of queer love, the scholars say. So clearly, Alvi is aware of queer scholarship um, and queer studies. And then the third and the thing that I want to spend some time on is the references or intertextuality. So you have Tennessee Williams and uh, Virginia Woolf. And they are um, they can be thought of as sort of being a part of a queer Anglophone canon. And then you have Fares at Mad Fares. So is by including these three figures, is Fares at Mad Fares being included in a queer canon? Um, alternatively, are Tennessee Williams and Virginia Woolf being included in a South Asian canon, right? So how are these terms operating? And um, what is this what is this doing for queer and south asian canon making and canon building and by canon here i just mean um um like really important and significant texts so is this a queer south asian poem so first we have to ask ourselves, what is a queer poem? And this is a question that Angiras and Katyal also ask in their introduction. Um, and I think they land on um, whether the poets think it's a queer poem um, and that is a fair um, interpretation. And I think that's one that I would go with. Uh, in the case of this poem, Alvi themselves uses queer. Um, so I think perhaps that puts it in this sort of category of queer South Asian poem. Um, but then we have this, these two questions that are really important for me. One is what work do the literary references do? Um, like I mentioned, you have Freud, Fares, Virginia Woolf and Tennessee Williams. Um, how are they uh, working together in making this a queer South Asian poem? 
And then what are the cultural implications of reading this poem as a queer South Asian poem or for using it to break down our understanding of these categories? So does this help expand categories of queerness and categories of South Asia? Um, does it present us with a mode of reading perhaps? So um, I want to end almost with leaving you with three questions that I'm not going to answer, but that are questions for you to think about. One is how does this poem participate in and resist canon building? Second, what does it mean for the categories of queer and South Asia if we think of this poem as a queer South Asian poem? And then third, are queer and South Asia more about ways of reading? And finally, some takeaways for you. Um, South Asia and queer are perhaps similar in their fluidity. Thinking about queer South Asia as a way of reading, thinking about translation as interpretation and iteration and reiteration. And then perhaps the choice to not translate is as important as the choice to translate. So why does Alvi choose to not translate fares in the poem? Um, I would be happy to take questions and um, thank you very much for your time. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now um, and hand over the virtual floor to Justin, I think. Hi, <laughs> and nice to meet you, Anandi. We've never met before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. First time here. Yeah. Apologize for my lateness. I came to my office at SOAS this morning to find everything had been unplugged. So I had to plug everything in and it took me about half an hour. But um, thank you for that fascinating um, presentation. I missed the beginning, but I think I got some of the more substantial um, content at the end. Um, and I hope that uh, people who watch this will have uh, will have questions and, uh, and that the questions you've asked will make them think uh, carefully about the material you have presented. Okay, right, it's my turn now. I've got my own PowerPoint teed up and I will try to get it going and share my screen also. And Anandi, you can tell me if <laughs> you can see it. Hold on, where am I? Uh, I think it is that one. Let me share. Okay, can you see a PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, good, there it is. <laughs> um, Right, so I'll introduce myself um, and uh, my uh, work at SOAS briefly before I begin um, the uh, very brief mini lecture, um, which is titled, Should We Say Burma or Myanmar? My name is Justin Watkins and I'm Professor of Burmese and Linguistics and I've been at SOAS um, nearly 30 years and um, during that time have been teaching uh, Burmese um, and occasionally Thai and also Khmer. And my interests and my research focus are on the languages and linguistics of Southeast Asia, principally mainland Southeast Asia, so former Indochina um, and Burma um, uh, slash Myanmar. Um, and um, I'm really, really um, passionate about the learning of languages by students who come to do their work at SOAS. I think uh, one of my reflections on Anandi's brief lecture is that without knowing the languages concerned, particularly in mixed texts and uh, texts with um, references to many different languages and from multicultural social contexts, without knowing those languages ourselves, we're not in a good position to uh, appreciate that work and think deeply about about those problems so um those of you who are thinking of coming to SOAS please um lock in um time and modules for learning languages during your time at, at SOAS there are all sorts of opportunities that you won't get um in other places right so um the background to this um lecture is that there are in English two names for the country um, which has and is known as Burma and or Myanmar. Um, and this is actually um, closely related to issues of translation, Anandi. So maybe um, we can have a, um, some reflection on, on your, the angle that you take on these issues. Um, but let me um, dive in first of all and give you some background. So the issue arises in Burmese, in the Burmese language, which is the main language um, of the country we are referring to, and we'll have to refer to it carefully without using any name, otherwise we um, get tied up in knots. 
Um, they're in, in the Burmese language, and of course there are lots of other languages and ethnicities in Burma too, but the main language of the country that mo people know more than any other language is Burmese, maybe 40 or 50 million speakers, perhaps more. Um, there are two ways of saying the same word, okay, and there is, we can loosely refer to these two forms of the same, the same word as formal, one in a formal register and one in an informal register. So the first is Nyama, pronounced Nyama, and I've deliberately uh, focused on writing this in Burmese because the issues play out very differently in Burmese and in English, and we need to keep the two separate, otherwise, again, we get tied into knots. So in Burmese, we have Nyama, a formal word, and Bama, an inform informal way of pronouncing, saying um, the same word. So these are the same word with the same um, etymological history that are used in two ways. The formal register of the language is mainly used in writing um, and in uh, speaking in formal contexts. And the informal uh, version of the word is used mostly in speech, but also in um, many forms of writing, less formal forms of writing. Um, okay. And what do we mean? by Myanmar or Burma, okay? And you'll remember that the longer one is Myanmar and the shorter one is Burma, because obviously I'm not expecting people um, listening and watching to know the Burmese script, but I want to emphasize that we're dealing, in, um, dealing with an issue in Burmese at this point. So on the one hand, both terms, Myanmar and Burma, are used to refer to the country on the left of your screen there, um, which is the nation state called um, Myanmar, or Burma, um, it has had many formal names um, in English and in Burmese over the years. Um, but these two words, Myanmar and Burma, are used to refer to that entity. The same word, Myanmar and Burma, is used to refer to the ethnic Burmese minor majority within that nation state, um, which has political borders drawn around it. So there is already a double meaning there is a, a, this double word, which itself has um, a double meaning, both referring to the nation state, the yellow shape on the left, and the sort of white space, um, which um, could be, I mean, linguistic mapping is a complex issue, but we can think of the majority of central, the central part of this country we're referring to as being ethnically Myanmar, Burma, um, speaking the Burmese language, um, and you'll see from, um, you get an impression from the map on the right of the mosaic and um, the tapestry of different ethnicities and languages and identities which are to be found in the country besides Myanmar slash Burma. Okay, so <clears throat> you may be asking, what does this crazy man mean when he's saying that Myanmar and Burma are the same word? Well, it's normal in the Burmese language for the sounds Mya and B to switch places. That's a normal thing to happen. So we've got some more examples here. The formal word for which is ni, the informal word for which is be. And Burmese is a language which does keep separate these two registers of the language, the formal and the informal variety, one used more in writing, one used more in, in speech. And the two have diverged over the centuries. Um, the second example I've got here is mi, um, which is the name of a town in southern in the southern part of the country, which is spelt mi, but pronounced be. Um, so if you're speaking about this town in formal context, you might refer to it as Mye, but probably Bait, but its spelling is Mye. So Mye and Be switch places in, in this language. That's a sort of sound um, exchange, which is normal. So it's not that odd to posit Myama and Bama as being the same word. The first syllable Mye has collapsed into a Be. That's really all that's happened. Um, okay, so where do we get the English word Burma from. Um, it's derived from the informal um, uh, counterpart of the two, the two names that we've been dealing with, Burma, which in Burmese is pronounced Burma, which I've represented in um, phonetic symbols at the top. That's how you would write down Burma in the international phonetic alphabet. Um, and the stress you'll hear is on the second syllable, Burma. And when in English attempts were made to write that sound down, um, using the conventions of English writing, it was first spelled B-U-R-M-A-H. So the U uh vowel was spelt it, spelled as U, uh, like in, um, I don't know, some words like curd, 
or um, the same same as the vowel in heard, so that uh, although that's usually a stressed vowel in English. And the stressed final vowel ah was represented with, as an ah to sort of draw the stress, make it feel like a long vowel. Um, but English doesn't really like words with that um, stress pattern. I can get very boring about this. My principal training is in phonetics. That's the part of uh, the branch of linguistics that I teach. English likes words which have the, st um, the stress principally on the first syllable and the second syllable is unstressed. So once this word bama was in English, it took on the shapes of English words and it became pronounced as Burma instead of bama. And the H fell off at some point. But it's still around, um, for example, in the name of Burma Oil, which was um, a company originally founded as the Rangoon Oil Company in 1886. So it goes back um, to the 19th century, the first um, uh, decades of contact, um, uh, colonial contact between um, Britain and um, the country that we're talking about, which I won't name. Okay, so Burma is, um, has um, that history. Um, and in English, um, and this sort of uh, became convention during uh, the decades when this country was um, a colony of Britain, um, Burma and Burma was used to refer to the entity on the left with boundaries drawn around it by um, colonial powers. Um, uh, and boundaries with complex histories themselves, all very interesting. Um, but so the country was referred to in English as Burma and the adjective, so English likes to have a noun and an adjective for countries. We have France and French, we have uh, Germany and German. Um, and in for this country, that pair became Burma and Burmese. And a second adjective was used in English, and this is we're now talking about issues of um, English usage. Um, a second adjective, Burman, was used when um, referring to the ethnic majority of this country. Um, so there were two adjectives, Burmese to refer to the country and Burman to refer to the Burmese speaking ethnic majority within that country. So already English doing its thing um, with uh, naming, nothing to do with let's scoot back and remember that both words are used in Burmese or were used for both words, Mimabama for, for both meanings. Okay, I hope I'm not laying it on too thick. I just think <laughs> it gets very confusing. Right, until 1989. So in 1989, um, the uh, country was in turmoil um, in some ways similar um, and as tragic um, to the way the country is in turmoil now. Um, and the uh, people in charge who called themselves the State Law and Order Restoration Council. Um, so um, uh, there were uh, huge uh, demonstrations, riots and um, uh, killings of protest protesters in 1988. And in 1989, the State Law and Order Restoration Council was um, uh, battening down power over the country, the military essentially, um, and they decided that they didn't want um, the English, the way that the country was, the country and its people were referred to in English to continue um, as it had been. So they decided that um, Burma, the English word Burma, should be Myanmar, reflecting the other word in Burmese. That Burmese should also be Myanmar, but that Burman, referring to the ethnic majority within the country we're talking about, should in English be referred to as Bama. Um, and so they made some new words in English. So Myanmar and Bama um, hadn't really existed as words in English before then. Um, and they wanted them to be translated, the Burmese words Myanmar and Bama to be translated in that way. Um, and with the meanings um, you see here. Okay, and they introduced new spellings um, for Burma. So the Bama, this time they put an R on the end to reflect the long stress vowel at the end, Bama. Um, and Myanmar, they also put an R on the end, um, which creates problems, of course, if you speak a variety of English that pronounces R's at the end of syllables. So, um, for example, North Americans might say Myanmar and Bamar with a R, which isn't there in Burmese. Okay, but that's what the state law and, um, and order restoration council decided. Um, hold on, where are we? Oh, hold on. 
uh, I've skipped ahead too much. Okay, so in the new English usage that the State Law and Order Restoration Council wished to be adopted on English language maps um, and English language reference to the country, they wanted the word Nama to refer to the whole country and Burma to refer to the Burmese ethnic majority within the country, even though in Burmese um, uh, usage had not really been divided. Um, so in a sense, they were legislating about the way they wished English to use words which we use differently in Burmese. Okay, and we've got some nice examples of how things have been before um, the adaptation of expressions law. Um, here are some banknotes, um, which themselves tell an interesting tale. You'll see that this is a um, 90 jet banknote, <laughs> and not many currencies have had denominations of 90 printed, and this is to do with um, General Ne Win, um, who had uh, stepped down in 1988. He, his astrologer told him that his lucky number was nine. Um, and to um, um, uh, Burmese numerology is a, a powerful force in politics and, um, and in thinking. And he believed that the currency would have more power if it was um, in denominations of nine or divisions of nine or multiples of nine. Um, and so for a while, there was a blisteringly confusing array of banknotes. Um, you could have... Um, uh, nine Jack banknotes, 15 Jack banknotes for some reason, 35 Jack banknotes, 45 Jack banknotes, um, um, all sorts of numbers related or in some cases not related to nine. However, the point here on this um, rather beautiful banknote, um, which reflects um, the, uh, this is a, a, a Burmese uh, peasant um, working with water buffalo. Um, looking happy in the uh, socialist state that the Burmese military had been promoting in the in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, and we'll see that in Burmese, the country is referred to as Myanmar. Okay, we've seen that spelling before here. Um, Anandi, can you see my pointer? You can, that's great. Okay, so the um, Myanmar we see here, so Piranzu Myanmar Nanga. Bank, which is the bank of the Union of Myanmar, which is translated on the on the other side of the banknote in English as Union of Burma Bank. Okay, so that's um, evidence that pre prior to the adaptation of expressions law, a Burmese the Burmese word Myanmar was translated officially in English as Burma on the banknotes issued by the state. Um, and we rush forward after. Um, much turmoil, anguish, and inflation to a 2016 banknote uh, for 10,000 jet, on which we see Myanmar Nangandor Bahuban, the central bank of um, Myanmar in Burmese, and central bank of Myanmar in English. So the English word, the, the new English word Myanmar is the, trans the, the state translation on its banknotes of the Burmese word Myanmar. So that's the switch. Um, and incidentally, the arrival of the 10,000 jet banknote was very welcome. Inflation had been rampant um, at various times. Um, and until this banknote was issued, which I think it was, I think it appeared only in 2015 or 2016, the largest, the largest denomination was 1,000 jet. So it was very, it was a great relief to many people to have banknotes of 10,000 jet. Okay, what is going on here? So one assertion is that the State Law and Order Restoration Council were had embarked on a process of decolonization with the adaptation of expressions law. Um, and for example, at the same time as renaming uh, Nyama and Bama in English, the English translations of uh, Nyama and Bama, uh, reconfiguring that they on the English language map of the country, they also changed the English language names. Um, and in fact, the Burmese language names of places that made, um, in their view, overt reference um, or indirect reference to um, colonial uh, history. So there we've got examples of two towns. So in, in before the adaptation of expressions law, Alan Mew, and Mew means town in Burmese, was a town named after um, uh, a major Alan who demarcated the frontier line in 1854. Um, after the um, Second Anglo-Burmese War, and another town, Mimu, some northeast of Mandalay, which got, um, which was, had been named after a 
uh, Colonel James May in the 5th Bengal Infantry. Um, so those references to colonial officers were removed from the Burmese and English language maps and the towns became known as Aulai and Pien Ulwe, respectively. Um, Rangoon was renamed on the English language map as Yangon. This is a slightly different issue. There's nothing um, directly decolonizing about, about this change, except that the English name Rangoon derives from the pronunciation of the name of that town in Arakanese, which is a language spoken in the Western, uh, Western province of, uh, of the country um, towards Bangladesh. Um, uh, which had been the language of first colonial contact. So it's a story that's a little bit similar to Peking becoming Beijing. So Peking is um, a representation of the name of that city in Cantonese, Baking, um, which got spelt as Peking in English. And then that was revised to Beijing to reflect the pronunciation of uh, the standardized form of Chinese, so Beijing became um, the preferred version from the Chinese um, perspective. Um, and Yangon reflects the pronunciation of the name of that city in Burmese rather than Arakanese. So in Arakanese it's Rangoon and in Burmese it's Yangon, which got um, spelt as Y-A-N-G-O-N. Um, okay, so that was going on. The English language map of the country was having um, uh, place names with uh, directly or indirectly colonial connections removed. Um, but at the same time, there was some recolonization going on. So the Burmese army's project over the decades, which is ongoing, is trying to um, assert power over parts of the country which have never really wanted to be part of the country, um, principally around the edges. Um, where languages other than Burmese are spoken. So at the same time as removing places like Alanyu and Mimu from the map, they also re removed names on the English language map of the country, which are in languages other than Burmese. So a nice example of that is the capital of Arakan State, the province to the, to the west of the country towards um, Bangladesh. Akyab, which is a Bengali place name, was replaced by Sidri, which is a Burmese name. Um, Kengdung, which is um, a town on the other side of the country towards um, the parts where Thailand, Laos and, and China sort of meet, um, the far, far eastern tip of uh, the country. Kengdung is in a language called Tai Kun, which is re uh, related to Thai and to Shan, one of the big languages spoken in the eastern side of the country. Um, and the Burmese way of pronoun pronouncing this name is Jaindong. Um, and so that Burmese pronunciation was shoehorned into an English spelling, um, which is slightly clunky, but that's what they decided on. And so on English language maps of the country, the um, adaptation of expressions law wanted Burmese language pronunciations to be reflected in English rather than uh, place names in languages other than Burmese. Another example is Mulmain, um, which was respelled in English as Molamyain. Um, where the Mon language is capital of Mon State in sort of southeast of the country towards Thailand, Mon being replaced by Burmese. So you could describe this as a Burmese linguistic land grab on the international English language map in a multilingual, multi ethnic area. So the State Law and Order Restoration Council didn't want um, people looking at English language maps of the country, so people outside the country around the world, to see representations of languages other than Burmese on those maps, perhaps suggesting that they didn't want those languages other than Burmese to be um, shown to represent power and influence and, um, and status. So quite insidious. Um, you, an, an analogy in Europe is the um, anglicization of the map of Ireland, where Irish place names were either translated or clumsily um, respelt in English. Um, and Irish, uh, Irish place names were removed in many cases, and you end up with um, complex situations there. Right, so who is asking us to change? In, during the 1990s, so in the years after the um, extremely um, violent events 
in the late 80s where the state law and the restoration council were going after people who um uh, protested against them and disagreed with their um their um power grab of the country um uh, so the generals who were behind the adaptation of expressions law were the people wanting english to use Myanmar. so people who um, either had to or um didn't mind aligning themselves with their values and their power um used Myanmar in the 1990s um whereas people who so here we've got a, a photo of some um national league from for democracy protesters outside the um em the Myanmar embassy in london and um, these people during the 1990s continued to call the country burma and um uh, they weren't very happy about um the violent uh, power grabbing generals telling them um what to call the country in english so there was a double name for a while and of course as a scholar if you're going to write about this country you needed to choose one or the other so for a long time people referred to the country as burma slash Myanmar, which is um uh clunky but a way of trying to um uh, not to upset both uh, either side um and people who lived in the country were in English tended to use Myanmar more because they had to when talking to officials or whatever. And the English language usage of uh, the use in, in English of Myanmar um, sort of took root um, after the 1990s among people who live in or had close connections or close interest in the country. Whereas the rest of the world and indeed languages other than english didn't really feel obliged to to change their usage for quite a long time there was a there was a lag um so for example no one really persuaded the french to stop saying birmani or the russians to say from saying birma um they all carried on using um the words they'd always used because the adaptation of expressions law was targeted were targeted english specifically as the international language which and the former colonial language which makes some sense Okay, so this throws up some interesting translation problems, um, and it's actually interesting that there's a translation theme in both our talks, and Andy, I hadn't uh, really thought about these issues through the through the lens of translation, but it really is a, a nice, <laughs> messy example. So, if we're going to use the, the the term Myanmar, um, what adjective do we use? English likes to have an adjective to um, to match country names, as we mentioned before. So, what do we do? Um, do we just stick with the word Myanmar? Or people have had a go of the years at making up their own adjectives. So I've seen in various places over the years, Myanmaris, Myanmaric, Myanmari, all of them pretty ad hoc and clunky and unlikely to take root. Um, so people tend to stick with Myanmar as an adjective, but it doesn't really feel great um, in English. Whereas before with Burma, Burma had as an anglicized form of the, um, uh the uh burmese word burma which had had time to bed into english it formed its own um in english adjectives which had decades to establish themselves whereas all of a sudden we were, um, english was required to make an adjective um from the now Myanmar, which didn't go so well um and other people thought, you know, what gives you the right to reach into my language and tell me what to say? And actually, I've, on Twitter, there's been some furious debate about um, the name of the city uh, Kyiv, um, which in Russian is Kyiv, and in Ukrainian is Kyiv. And um, given the events in Ukraine at the moment, people are in English trying hard to name the capital of Ukraine in, a Ukra in the Ukrainian language way, not the Russian way. That's another talk. It gets very complex, but people are trying because they suddenly they don't want to be caught out using um, the in English the name of a city which uh, chimes with the language of the oppressor. Okay, um, and in English, you know, is a language like English allowed to have its own words for things well some people say yes you know don't tell me what to call your place um, it's my language back off which is a complex issue um, given um, the uh, colonial power um, and international reach of english but you know do we um i mean it's difficult to find um uh, good comparators um we might say that for um 
uh, places like Germany, you know, we it's a European country with um, a history um, which aligns uh, in some ways with that of the English language. So no, if, if German Germany suddenly said in English, you've got to say Deutschland. We don't want you saying Germany anymore. That probably wouldn't go very well. Do we say Paris or Paris? Do we say China or Dongguo? Do we say Peking or Beijing or Beijing? What do we what do we do when people would like us to call places in their um, country in English using a different word? And of course, each context is completely different. Bombay and Mumbai is you know, different again. Each of these um, have uh, you know, they're not comparable situations or contexts. Okay, so um, this is a lady with a, um, a somewhat checkered history now, but at the time when um, these issues first came to the fore, she was internationally recognized as something of a saint. And she said, you can call my country either Burma or Myanmar. I'm accustomed to calling it Burma in English. So she wasn't going to allow the generals to reach into her, lang her English language usage and uh, mess around with it. She said, it's up to you because there's nothing in the constitution of our country that says we must use any term in particular. And she said that in April 2016, which is about a year before things became <laughs> rather different for her, but we won't get into that issue. As a side topic, I sometimes use this lecture um, alongside um, in a cultural studies uh, lecture with um, where, where I use a photograph of someone who I saw at a Halloween party in 2017, so October 2017, who had dressed up as Aung San Suu Kyi, um, uh, stained with blood and carrying a dagger. So that's how much her reputation changed in a short time. Anyway, that's, um, we could talk all day about tragic events in, um, in Burma, but we're not here to do that. Okay, so then we say also that English has special reach. It's colonial and international. As mentioned before, other languages have not been um, persuaded to change um, their usage. Um, sometimes in diplomatic contexts they have, but casual usage, casual naming of this country in here we've got French and Birmania probably covers Spanish, Italian and a few other Romance languages. In the third one is Thai, which calls Burma Pama and Russian, which called, refers to the country as Birma. Um, so again, they're not really part of the same picture. You can't transport this discussion into, into other languages. Um, a generation later, has acceptance of the English name Myanmar done the general's work for them? We tend to find um, that people, especially, as I said before, people who live in and work on or have close connections um, or formal connections to the country will, in English, call the place Myanmar. Um, and uh, they might use also, if they're really um, involved in, in the country, you could call the ethnic majority of the country uh, Burma in English. Although that doesn't have um, wide currency and it's probably not some, most people have heard of Myanmar now, not many people have heard of Burma as an English word. Um, okay, um, so what risks do we take by working only in English? If you're going to um, understand the difference between Burma and Myanmar in English, there's quite a lot of um, thinking and reading and um, understanding and listening to be done. Um, and if we don't know how the words play out in Burmese, in the Burmese language, then um, we risk uh, misrepresenting ourselves and others um, by using the wrong names. Um, so if you're going to work on Burma, and I try to carefully refer to the country as um, alternating between Burma and Myanmar, <laughs> one term or the other, um, because I think both are fine. Um, and uh, in Burmese, if I'm speaking about the country in Burmese, it doesn't matter. There just is, is no difference, apart from the formal, informal difference. So nuance is important um, if we don't uh, take the trouble, if we're going to work on Burma, Myanmar, or indeed um, any other part of the world which isn't English speaking, then if by working only in English, we are um, at risk of misrepresenting ourselves and others. Um, how can we remain objective when we have to make obligatory linguistic choices? So translators um, 
and people naming places have to use one word and not another. There, you have to, you can't um, uh, fudge everything. You have to choose sometimes. And remaining objective when we have to choose um, is is very difficult. So the um, these tenuous um, formulations like Burma slash Myanmar are precarious and uncomfortable and um, uh, messy, and they don't last. Um, and they're a uh, that people use them because they're forced to. There's a nice example in Northern Ireland of Derry slash London Derry or London slash Derry. There are various ways that they play out where there is a political tension um, and uh, people feel uncomfortable using one form or another. Um, but um, in writing, translation and uh, translating and speaking, we have to we have to make choices and we need to think carefully about what we're doing when we do that. Um, and that is Jesu de Mani, which is thank you in Burmese. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, and Laura, over to you, what happens now? We've only got just a few wee minutes um, left. So probably time for one question. If um, somebody wants to ask anything via the Q&A, if not, I'm sure you're very welcome to get in touch via email. Um, and to follow up. The session has been recorded and so you'll be able to watch it back um, and to refer to anything um, that you might have missed. And there's also lots more sessions coming up um, over the course of the morning. So everybody should have a timetable or a schedule that will um, let them navigate it, but we probably have to wrap up in the next um, one to two minutes just to let the next sessions um, kick off. Okay. I can't see any questions in the Q&A box, so unless anyone wants to um, dive in with one that we can try to answer um, in the next one or two minutes, then um, we can wrap up here. But like I said, oh, here we are. There's one um, just popped into the chat, um, which is one more general question about the SOAS programme, which says, does the course also cover Burmese language? So I don't know if you want to answer that super quickly. Um, before we end the session? I, I wouldn't use the word cover. Uh, <laughs> most of the years that I've worked at SOAS, um, Burmese has been available. Whether it will be available in the future um, is unclear. That's all I can say. I hope so. No problem. And if you do want to stay up to date, then please do just check our website. They refresh the list with all of the open modules and different course content. So do stay up to date. And if you need us to um, clarify anything for you, then we're very happy um, to help. I think, unfortunately, we may. Oh, we do have another. Have we got another one? Oh, here's a big question for one minute, but I can ask it. Um, what is the relationship between nationalism and translation? How does our social location affect the choice of our translation? I don't know if either of you want to attempt that in I one minute. This is definitely you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a big question that it's difficult to answer in one minute. Um, so my brief answer is that yes, um, translation has been used in nationalist projects. Um, and I think Justin's presentation um, showed a really good example perhaps of that in some ways, um, but also within um, South Asia, within India, um, often uh, the ways in which Hindi is used and the ways in which translation projects happen into Hindi um, are really interesting and uh, worth exploring more. Um, and you can do that if you come to SOAS. <laughs> Great answer in one minute. <laughs> oh. we, could have, we could have spent an hour. On yes, <laughs> yes, I could have given you an hour long answer, but this is my one minute answer. Perfect. Thank you so much. But I think we'll wrap up there just to um, let everybody get into their next sessions. But um, do join us, stay. And we will also have a live chat coming up on the 13th of April if you want to hear more generally from SOAS. So if you are applying and you are thinking about um, coming to join us, then do look out for that invitation in your emails. But thank you very much. And thank you to um, our academics for um, delivering the session. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.